Hello, my name is Dante Renee, and welcome to the Ten Room Bizarro YouTube page where I talk about films that I believe need to be talked about more. Like tonight's film, this is 1975's Oriental Blue. 1975's Oriental Blue, and this is directed by Bill Milling, who also did The Vixens of Kung Fu, which I've also looked at on this YouTube page. Uh, this is part of the Vinegar Syndrome Drive-In Collection. It has both of these films on there. And uh, for the purposes of tonight, we're looking at Oriental Blue, which was 1975, which was also the year for the Vixens of Kung Fu. Um, there is a, definitely an Asian theme going on here with both of these films. On the poster for Oriental Blue, it says, Rated 100% Hottest Film of the Year. A classy production, superb acting, great for couples, a must for everyone. The best in the sex pose genre in some time. A super sexy, quote, China girl, which I've looked at on this YouTube page, with some of the best, most beautiful bodies in the business, hotter than an erupting volcano, as said by Pleasure. Uh, Oriental Blue. There's the poster once again, uh, backwards, of course. And here are some screenshots. There's one screenshot from this particular film. And there's the back. And I picked that, uh, th this disc up uh, for about, I think it was about 15 bucks, something like that. So let's get into this film here. I have notes written, so you're going to see my eyes divert. And um, this is quite a production. This is quite an awesome X-rated uh, film. You know, we start off this movie with an unbelievable title uh, credit sequence. And it's very, very interesting because the music to me sounds like Wendy Carlos. It sounds like Wendy Carlos. Wendy Carlos, um, formerly, I believe, Walter Carlos, uh, who is most notably known for doing the score music for Stanley Kubrick's films like Clockwork Orange and The Shining. And it really sounds like there are pieces of music at the beginning of this film that are from possibly The Shining. Or it sounds like Wendy Carlos's music, definitely. Uh, or variations of. Um, we have kind of city, red, light, night, uh, real shots um, of the city. And there is definite tension and suspenseful, powerful editing in the beginning of Oriental Blue. Definitely. There's an Asian font to the, to the words, to the credits, um, interchanging with scenes of the movie beginning, moving forward um, with the credit sequence. And I gotta tell you, the title set, the title sequence is really just a wow experience. Uh, mystery, darkness, terror, there's something going on, and it's really fascinating. And uh, just, I would say, very, very professionally, powerfully done. Um, it really brings you in. Now, we have real people um, on the streets, you know, being filmed, uh, definitely looks to be, you know, no permits or, or, you know, kind of that renegade gorilla shooting style. And we have an older Asian woman as the lead in this film. You know, that is something that is not, you know, she probably would not be casted for a modern X-rated film. Uh, with similar themes, possibly, okay? So this kind of shows you the cinematic climate back then, and it's so, so awesome and great. You know, while these films were politically, would be deemed politically incorrect today, they also had a, 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 a piece of all-inclusiveness with who they hired and, and, and who was acting in the films. And this this Asian lead, the lead is an older woman, um, and her body's amazing, and she's involved in, like, all this, like, most of the sex scenes in the film. But she has an older vibe to her. Very interesting. Now, in the film, we have white slavery, a white slavery ring, and it's being led by a woman. Definite New York City vibes in Oriental Blue as well. And an interesting conversation in the film about what girls... Uh, a, a particular businessman wants, what girls he wants to purchase from this white slavery uh, business, what kind of girls and what they look like, uh, what they will do, you know, uh, who, they, who they should be ethnically. Uh, very, very interesting. Uh, we have orchestrated suspense music with organ and piano. Uh, an interesting 
uh, interesting drink in the film called, quote, love juice. And it is an herbal, kind of an Asian herbal aphrodisiac that has immense power, though. It's, it, it's, it's more than an aphrodisiac. It's a life changer. Um, this, we have some red lights glimmery on pale white skin. It's red lighting, you know, and maybe that flies, you know, the red light district, red lighting. Uh, we also have spooky, spacey music in this film as well, definitely. Our lead's interaction with the sex scenes, the, the, the older Asian woman's um, interaction in the sex scenes, um, very interesting because she's involved in them all, as I stated. And when I say older, you know, I, you know, she probably wasn't that much older, but by today's standards in erotic films, she would have an older look, okay? Uh, she, you know, she didn't look like Jade Wong, okay? She was, you know, this woman had an older look and, and, and she was involved in everything. Um, the training, there was, a, there was a specific training for girls to, to be entered into uh, this white slavery ring as well. And the headquarters of this white slavery business is under a Chinese restaurant to cover up the noise. We have lesbianism in this film, uh, lots of it, and great lesbian scenes, 70s rock sounds um, that reminded me of like Jefferson Airplane, um, and female singing, you know, in the 70s rock songs. Um, all different sex angles in this film, uh, with a great emphasis and focus on... Um, you know, uh, conolingus and, and, and oral in general, but with the vagina in general. And an interesting conversation, you know, talking about what girl they need. And then you get glimpses of that particular girl walking the streets before um, she gets kind of captured or taken. So a very interesting editing style is really what I meant there. A very interesting editing style the kind of this forward thinking editing that's happening here you know we need a girl like this then you see then it cuts to the girl that girl that they're going to pick up later on walking the streets really really cool editing style there um and you know something that uh shows some artistic um thinking with with how they're telling the story we have 60s jazz rock sleaze hybrids um the interesting thing, gender-wise, for Oriental Blue is that the men in the film are at the beck and call of the Asian woman boss to get girls. A, a woman leads the white slavery ring, the, the white slavery prostitution ring, and the woman is in charge of men, and the, me, the, the men who get the women. Women, the, the, the woman is in charge. We have kind of reverb, guitar, surf-sounding music as well in the film. Um, and, uh, it's interesting, you know, the, the, for the training sequences, the, the master can't help but get involved in the training sequences, you know, in the movie, um, the, the sexual training sequences. We have a New York businessman, um, you know, kind of uh, talking th through this film as a character. He kind of has a real kind of New York vibe to him, and you've seen him in countless other Golden Age films. Um, most notably, even, you know, the, the film Corruption with Jamie Gillis as well, who's also in this film. Uh, the, the, the interesting, uh, there's another interesting element in here. The master, the Asian woman, the master, I'm going to call her the master, she doesn't sign contracts when she makes business deals. Uh, she seals deals in sex. And so sex takes on this other force in this film. There's many different, you know, kind of redefinitions for sex and, and for, for, for sexual acts in Oriental Blue in, in light of business and power and life change. 70s classic rock music in here as well, folks. Uh, we got... Uh, a great scene uh, with two girls, one guy, actually a, a couple scenes. Uh, so we have lesbianism and, and multiple girls, one guy. Um, the music overall in Oriental Blue has a suspenseful vibe to it. it definitely. There's some kind of, there's something brewing, something boiling. Um, there's, um, 
you know, there's mirrors, mirror shots uh, in this film, great reflection shots, and there's like this, this one scene with this like kind of very bizarre doll. You're kind of, and, and the camera focuses on it. It's just kind of, it's sitting up somewhere on a ledge, and it's just this bizarre doll there. So I thought that was like extremely interesting. Um, that it was focused upon in, in one scene. Uh, we have an amazing line from Jamie Gillis in this film um, as he's trying to get a girl off the street. Actually, Brie Anthony, one of my favorites, uh, who's also in Vixens of Kung Fu and a movie called More, which I'll be looking at uh, on this um, YouTube page. Um, but the interesting thing is Jamie Gillis, as he's joking to this innocent girl uh, about what he's really doing. Um, and he, <laughs> you know, he's talking to her and she's nervous about going with him. And he's going to help her out, he said, because she's kind of lost in the city. And he says, oh, I might be a white slaver, you know, um, and uh, I, I, out to, you know, out to get you. you know, something like that. And she laughs and, uh, you know, oh, that really breaks the, that, that, that you know, that kind of breaks the ice. But really, he is a white slaver trying to get someone. And so that was a very humorous and very powerfully done uh, and terrifying scene that reminded me a lot of Kurt Russell in Death Proof when he's going to make the left or the right turn. And uh, um, with uh, the girl in the passenger seat and... Um, he says, well, it's a good thing, you know, or actually it's a bad thing you wanted to go left because, you know, and if you remember that scene in Death Proof, you'll, you'll know a little bit of what's happening here as well. But it's, it's slightly in a different angle for this scene in here. Um, Jamie Gillis is amazing in this film. Uh, there's a scene where he's talking in a mirror while he's smoking a cigarette. The smoke of the cigarette, the way he's talking, he's just amazing in here. Um, he's such an amazing actor. The tension of Jamie Gillis bringing an innocent to his house, uh, just the way the atmosphere is, just the way it feels, it feels crazy, it feels weird, um, you feel the girl's terror and confusion, and then all of a sudden there's an acrobatic guy who jumps from the ceiling to with a boner, um, a very bizarre scene there, um, and... I, I will say this too, I, you know, there's um, there's a song in here that is a mainstream rock song from the, from the 70s, you know, You're No Good, I think the chorus is. So I don't know how they flew with that in this movie as well with copyrights, but chances are, eh, they didn't use them. Um, so we do have, you know, kind of a, possibly some famous mainstream 70s music that were on the charts uh, during this time as well. Um, Here's a great quote here. I'm just tired of doing everything that chink cunt wants. You can get the vibe, you can get the energy of Oriental Blue and the renegade filmmaking of a film like this. Um, there is, you know, a plot point in the story where there's rebellion within the white slavers, the guys who are getting the girls, and also the aspect of possibly falling in love with them or one of them. Um, and there is a weird magic French man in this film that I can't really describe, but it is bizarre. He is bizarre. Um, the, you know, kind of, there's this thing they're working off of where, you know, the girl says, you can do everything but fuck me, you know, and, um, candles, red lights, spotlights, a neon phallus blinking into the edit. It's surreal. There's a swing, there's synth music. It's very bizarre. It's operating in another world, another reality, this one particular scene. There's a lot of, there, there's a, not a lot, but a couple times of the use of black dildos in this movie. There's exploitation and crime in this film. Uh, the smoking of cigarettes in this film is like an art. It's artistic, um, the smoke. Losing control of your sexuality, sexual addiction in the face of loving just one person. These are some other themes in Oriental Blue. We have gong sounds in the movie, randomly. We have saxophone jazz in the film. People entering from behind a reflection in a mirror, this amazing square mirror. Um, 
in this in, in this particular shot in in a darkly lit kind of dungeonous type of room. We have a lot of dirty talk in this film, great dirty talk. Uh, we got butt licking in the movie in one particular scene, a lesbian scene. Um, cutting between two sex scenes, almost as if they are telepathically connected and physically connected with almost a 2001 Space Odyssey classical um, music vibe to it. Okay, it is a very interesting um, sex edit between two scenes that really feel like they are more than complementing each other. They are connected with each other from uh, telepathically, sexopathically. Um, we have great shots from the ground up in this film, uh, cinematography-wise. Uh, a a storyline of customers, you know, breaking the rules, overthrowing the leadership. Um, the love juice might, rep you know, also represented to me a bit of a drug, a junkie, an addict. We have Asian sounds in the movie and screams in the soundscapes of this interesting film. Um, in the climax of Oriental Blue, wow, what a climax, we have fighting, twists, turns, um, it, it sucker punch, violence, murder, storyline sucker punches in the climax of this film that just keep going. Reminded me a bit of um, Super Soul Brother, which I looked at on this YouTube page, in terms of the, the twists just keep coming in an exploitation type style. And 1975's Oriental Blue ends with an image of loss and pain. And you ask yourself the question, who is the lead in Oriental Blue? Who really is the main actor or the main actress in Oriental Blue? This was 1975's Oriental Blue by Bill Milling. And it ends with pain and loss and hopelessness. Thank you so much for watching the Ten Room Bizarro YouTube page where I talk about films that I believe need to be talked about more, like 1975's Oriental Blue. Thank you and good night.